Welcome to the Love People Use Things podcast. My name is Matt Fradd and it's really great to have you with us. Um, Big thanks to everybody who's been listening to the show, leaving us reviews on iTunes, who's been supporting the show on Patreon. Um, I think it's really beginning to gain some ground. You know, these podcasts do take time. More and more people get to hear about them. They share them with other people. And so big thanks if you've been one of those people who's helped the show by supporting it financially or just sharing it with friends or reviewing it on iTunes. It really good for you and, and thanks so much. Um, if you want to listen to the back catalog of shows that we've done, go to Love People Use Things things.fm and there you can see all of the episodes there uh, we're in season three right now and so unlike other podcasts that focus on events of the day these podcasts are in a sense timeless so you could go back and listen to the very first episode and get just as much out of it today as if you had have listened to it back when it was first released so whether you're somebody who's struggling with pornography whether you love somebody who does, or maybe you're just looking for more information so that you can write a better class paper. These podcasts, I think, are going to be a big help. So again, go to lovepeopleusethings.fm. i got a treat for you today. I want to share with you a uh, talk that was given by my friend, uh, Dr. Donald L. Hilton, who is a neurosurgeon, uh, an MD. He's written uh, numerous peer-reviewed uh, articles or studies on how pornography affects the brain. Very knowledgeable guy. And in today's episode, he's going to share uh, with you how porn affects the brain and what can be done about it. The title of the talk is Pornography Addiction, a Supranormal Stimulus and Neuroplasticity. So if you've been wanting to know what does neuroscience say about the brain, this is uh, and how pornography affects the brain, I should say, this podcast is going to help you tremendously. This talk by Dr. Donald Hilton is going to help you tremendously. If you want to support the Love People Use Things podcast and the work that I do is I travel around the country and give talks, and if you want to get a bunch of free stuff in return, all you got to do is go to lovepeopleusethings.fm. There you can support this show and this work for $10 a month, and I'm going to send you couple of books, sticker, free t-shirt, you'll get access to free live streams and a bunch of other things. Um, So it's it's a pretty cool thing that I'm giving you in return for your support. I won't go through all those gifts. You can go and look at exactly what those gifts are. Signed books, stickers, as I say, all those different things. Go to lovepeopleusethings.fm, click support and choose to give 10 bucks a month or you can give more if you want or you're going to give two bucks a month if you want. I don't care. Just help me uh, keep this show going. That would be tremendous and I'd be humbled and grateful by your support for your support all right here we go here's a talk from dr donald hilton enjoy the show and then share it with others now have you had anyone tell you well you know you can say what you want about pornography but in the end it's just a first amendment issue right it's not an addiction anyone heard that Um, What about, um, there's no peer-reviewed study that says pornography is addictive. Anyone heard that one? You will if you haven't. Um, Have you seen in the popular press recently um, papers that have been been given echo time in the popular press saying pornography is not addictive? You will if you haven't. There was one last summer and there was one in the fall as well. And they both said just that. What I would like to do today, and we don't have a lot of time to do this, um, is kind of scroll through some of the ideas and concepts behind why pornography can become an addiction, can become an addiction. I I use that not in a uh, a light semantic term. I use that in a brain-changing sense of the word when I use the word addiction, a real sense, like heroin or like cocaine addiction. Okay, so I'm not mincing words here biologically. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and and about what the dark side, as I call them, those that like pornography and that say that it's not just, it's not only not addictive, it's actually helpful. And of course, as Marianne has just told us, that's false, that's not true, but they say it. And the press, of course, loves to publish anything that says pornography is great because sex sells, as we know. Now, we're, we're being flanked right now. You know, those, particularly in academic, the apologism in academic sexology today is, in my opinion, appalling. And so we're being flanked by the press in this. They're coming up. About 80 miles from this spot, there's a beautiful spot of ground it's very peaceful today. 
If you go there, it's a great place to walk around, to read, to contemplate. There's trees, there's grass. But in 1863, in July, it was anything but that, if any of you have been to the Gettysburg battlefield. And that was a war about exploitation. And we've heard several references to slavery today. I agree with Mary Ann. If prostitution is sex work, then antebellum slavery in the Civil War is cotton work. Think about that for a minute. It's exploitation of humans. We have a tendency as humans to do that. We have to guard ourselves. And for some reason, this permission-giving belief that Marianne's talked about, we somehow feel we're entitled to exploit and abuse people it's with racism, with everything, if it's sexual. If we attach sexuality to it, it's okay to exploit and abuse human beings today, still. If you're approached by anyone, either from the press or for academics or those that challenge you and say it's not an addiction, please talk to me. I'd be happy to help you talk to them. Now, this paper here, and it's in the back, uh, the, the talk really comes from this, and I'm, going to, I'm not going to strictly follow or adhere to what this is talking about. This is a paper I published in the journal Socioaffective Neuroscience and Psychology last year. And basically what it says, it's a lot of kind of, what does those words mean, but supranormal stimulus we'll talk about means something that we don't normally encounter in nature or something that's extra, what we usually account. Like if I'm really hungry and I'm going back and there's a plate of celery or there's German chocolate cake, the German chocolate cake's going to win. It's a higher stimulus, right? Of course. And so the other thing is neuroplasticity. Well, plastic means changeable, moldable. Can the brain change? Can it mold if we learn? Oh, absolutely. Yes. The answer is no question. It does change if we learn. In fact, two scientists, Keller and Malinka, in a paper about how brain cells change with addiction, defined addiction not just by behavioral mechanisms of whether or not someone follows a certain constellation of behaviors, but as a pathological yet powerful form of learning and memory. The frantic clicking and searching for exactly the right masturbatory climax clip is a study in neuroplasticity. It's a perfect model. Now, the dark side doesn't agree with us here. This is Steve uh, Yagiolowitz, uh, senior editor of XBiz. I'll just read some of this. Again, you can look at this later. But basically what he says, if you look at the top paragraph, look, everyone's talking about pornography being addictive, like, but drugs, booze, and cigarettes, well, those are really addictive. It's not based upon legitimate, unbiased research. Uh, in fact, he goes on that says these are measurable. These are physical things. So the number one thing he says, to be addictive, it has to be a physical agent, something you take into your body. It can't be a behavior. That's, he clearly says that here. And then um, no one ever died from looking at porn. We know that's not true. There's something called psychiatry and emotional axis, melancholy depression that produces suicide, all these things. And they kind of forget that. They're just looking at a myocardial infarction from a cocaine overdose or breathing, a cessation of breathing from a heroin overdose. But what about those the emotional axis? We actually do have emotions as humans. And then the bottom one, he kind of scoffs. I mean, come on, ice cream, chocolate. There's a researcher at UCLA currently saying porn is good. It's not addictive. And in fact, it's just like chocolate. It's the same part of the brain. Yeah, it is. Porn, pornography and chocolate, same part of the brain lights up. Cocaine, same part of the brain. Heroin, same part of the brain. Alcohol, same part of the brain. Okay, so it's just a matter of degree and type. Now, another one, back uh, in, in this uh, last election cycle we had, one of the apologists said, there's not even a smidgen that such evidence exists. Not a smidgen. Not, so I'd like you, as we go through some of this today, to just remember the word smidgen and see if you agree at the end, okay? And the word evidence, and we'll talk about that word as we go through this. 
Now, this is one, Dr. Marty Klein, and we'll read what he said. Let's take a moment. He said another way to conceptualize sex addiction is as a violation of society's moral. Now, he's using the word moral because that implies a judgment thing that you and I may have a different opinion about what is moral or not, right? And, of course, we all might have subtle nuances in how we define that term. So he's defining it strictly on a First Amendment judgment basis, standards along with someone's distress. So it's arbitrary. If there's no distress and there's no moral violation, then there's no problem. One should not self-stimulate too much, according to common norms. One should not have too much indiscriminate sex, cheat on one's spouse, be too sexually involved with porn objects, or with those whom there's no romantic love to redeem the sex, such as casual pickups or sex workers. The sex addiction concept helps patrol these arbitrary moral boundaries. At its core, addiction isn't just a social problem or moral problem or criminal problem. It's a brain problem whose behaviors are manifest in all these other areas. It's about underlying neurology, not outward actions. It's Dr. Michael Miller of ASAM, the American Society of Addictive Addiction Medicine. And basically, he's saying, no, Marty Klein, Dr. Klein, it's not about morals only. Yes, we may have our moral opinions, but there's a biological argument as well. And so while you're strictly defining it on morals and and ignoring any biological consideration, we're saying, have your morals if you want, but there's a biological consideration as well. And that's what's important here. ASAM's definition said that addiction is a chronic disease. They use the disease word of the brain. Why? That means departure from normal, affecting three systems, reward, motivation, and memory. And for the first time, addiction is defined as including non-substance addictions in their new definition, such as to food, sex, and gambling. This is huge. So in other words, pornography addiction is a natural, what we call natural addiction, that is a legitimate brain addiction according to the American Society of Addiction Medicine, which is composed of medical doctors who, by requirement, have to have a medical doc- a degree as an MD to be able to treat drug withdrawal. So they're a very biologically based group. Okay, And so they're saying that, yes, it is natural drug addiction. It's all the same. Whereas you have some academic sexologists like Dr. Klein who basically say, mm, I'm, I, I know more about the biological considerations in these MDs, and I'm saying, no, it's not. So um, going on, as far as natural or drug addiction, so we have this concept, and you'll see uh, when you talk about natural or process addiction, sexuality, food, and gambling, of course, we're familiar with cocaine, methamphetamine, opioids. And so we also, you'll hear the term for natural addiction as process or addictions to a process. So ASAM's definition in the, de- if you go to their webpage, addiction affects neurotransmission and interactions between memory circuits and brain reward structures such that the memory of previous exposures, there's that memory, remember m- motivation, reward, and memory are the three axes in the brain that are affected by addiction. So memory of previous exposures to rewards such as to food, sex, alcohol, and other drugs leads to a biological and behavioral response to external cues, in turn triggering craving and or engagement in addictive behaviors. Based on behavior, not biology, according to the DSM. What's the DSM? The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Of course, the therapists here understand what that is. Basically, this is the Bible for some in terms of what is an addiction and what is not an addiction. The DSM-5 that just came out said, eh, we don't think it's an addiction. Interestingly, they did put one behavioral addiction in their behavioral addiction section. They said gambling, and yet they left out uh, food and they left out sexuality. Now, if you go back to the DSM-3 in 1980, it was atheoretical. In other words, they said, we're not even going to try to be a biological etiology manual. We're not going to even say what addiction is or what causes it. We're just going to describe the behavior and base our diagnosis on a patient coming into the office, use interview and observation to make a diagnosis on that patient. And that is actually the utility of the DSM. And it's helpful as a field manual for that. The problem is that many now think it's a biology textbook and that it's supposed to tell us what the brain says, what a brain addiction is. 
And since 1980, the DSM-3, they said, look, we're not going to be that. We're going to stay out of the biology business. Why do we think still, we culturally, and why does the press, why do we still try to make the DSM a biology textbook? The Diagnostic and Statistical Manuals, there's five, five editions. So if we go back and look, for instance, at poker. So based on the current DSM-5, masturbation and, and pornography are not an addiction, but poker is. So you have two unfortunate individuals, let's say mid-20s, in adjacent rooms, they're identical twins, they're exactly alike, and one of them is clicking frantically on blackjack, trying to get that monetary reward. The other is clicking frantically, looking for the perfect clip for a masturbatory reward. They're both intermittently reinforced rewards, and the DSM says one is an addiction and one is not. Really? Think about the, it's a ludicrous statement, really, and yet that's what, that's what we have right now. Now, here's another one. Uh, David Lay said it, that porn is actually healthy. It provides a legal outlet for illegal sexual behaviors or desires. And its consumption or availability has been associated with decrease in sex offenses, especially child molestation. We need better methods to help people who struggle with high-frequency use of visual sexual stimuli without pathologizing them or their use thereof. Okay, I I don't have time right now. Marianne's done a wonderful job of going through and debunking this patently false statement. This is false. This is not true. And again, if you want to come talk to either one of us, to Gail, to many, we can, we can go through the literature. We can talk about why they say this, this decrease in sexual offenses. It's based on studies by Milton Amato, others, uh, or uh, Milton Diamond, Amato, and others. And these are flawed studies. They have serious flaws. For one thing, they're correlative studies, and they're inferring causation. But even the correlation has significant problems as well. I don't have time to even go in there. It's about a 10-slide discussion to even go into why those are flawed studies. But that's a false statement. Yet the media grabs this and runs with it. Now, going back to cigarettes, in the Salon article, they said to really prove pornography addiction based on the sexologist standard, you would need to take two cohorts of children, addict one with cigarettes, give all, okay, little five-year-olds, here's your little cigarettes, and then give the other one some cigarettes and say, we're going to protect this group, we're going to addict this group. We're going to scan them before and after and see how their brains change and correlate that with the behavior. That's what this Salon article says. The standard has to be, according to academic sexologists that are pro-pornography, to prove that pornography is addictive. That's their standard, to prove it, okay, in, that, in this paper. So I ask them, where is the tobacco study? You know, the child study on tobacco. Anyone familiar with it? And the, you know, the one where you take two cohorts of children and you give them all the cigarettes. So they want to do the, the porn study. They, want, they say you have to give the kids pornography, half of them pornography, the other half protect them. We don't have that for tobacco. We don't have that for pornography. It doesn't exist and it never will because of the, the issue of ethics. And we found out about that, of course, in the Nuremberg trials as we came out of Auschwitz and dealt with the... Uh, the terrible ethics of the Nazis. So yet there are still people today that will say nicotine is not addictive. There's still a suit going on today where there's a PhD that actually says cigarettes are not addictive. I mean, so it doesn't surprise us that others will say to pornography is good for you. Of course not. I'm, I'm sorry to say my profession hasn't always done real well in the medical side. This is General Washington in his deathbed. And he, he had, of course, had a throat infection he was bled. When you go back and add the blood that was bled, they bled him. Remember that? You had a fever. Ooh, blood's hot. The person's hot. So if we get the hot out, they get better. Ugh, sorry, guys. That was our profession back then. They bled him. About half of his blood volume in a few hours. General Washington was bled to death by his doctors. Okay? And, and that was our profession. That was the smart doctors of the day. Porn's good for you. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say, going back to the tobacco issue... You know, we haven't done very well there either. These are real. These are real, guys. You know, um, this guy's an ENT doctor. I mean, give your throat a vacation, a permanent one. I mean, think about that. These are real. This is an ENT, an ear, an ear surgeon. I mean, a, sorry, a throat, ear, nose, and throat surgeon telling you to smoke, that it's going to help your throat. Um, do you have a cough? Do you... Do you really want to get rid of that cough? Um, what about, are you, um, 
Are you addicted to alcohol? Well, cocaine tonic's really good for, for getting rid of that. <laughs> it's about 110, 20 years ago. Does your child have a toothache? Okay, it really works. Notice at the top it says physicians and surgeons recommended, okay? So there's that doctor thing again. So we, we really haven't done real well. And the cocaine thing, now, I was trained in Memphis, and the surgeon that trained me was trained by someone who was trained by someone who was trained by this man in the center. That's William Halstead at Johns Hopkins. He is the father of American surgery. And we can all, as surgeons, trace our surgical training pedigree back to this man, pretty much, in this country. I mean, he changed surgery. First guy to do gloves uh, with surgery. Back then it was bare hands with your surgeon. Imagine that. You go in, your surgeon's going to operate with no gloves. I know. Halstead did all of that. He's the one that started that for us and many other things. It turns out this wonderful man struggled with addiction his whole life and no one knew it. There's a great book out on it called Anatomy of an Addiction about his addiction to cocaine. It turns out that cocaine is really good, still used for blocking eye for ophthalmology, it's also good for blocking digits. Remember lidocaine, novocaine, cocaine, they're all cousins. Cocaine was the first one. And by blocking digits, he found you could do surgery. And he came up with digital blocks with cocaine. But he found out that if you snort it in between or use it in between cases, it really makes you feel good. <laughs> and so uh, mo- over half of the people that were addicted to cocaine in those early years, 100 years ago, were physicians because they had access to it, and they didn't realize. They thought it was just harmless fun, like we think many times culturally pornography uh, is harmless fun, many think today. Um, and yet, cocaine we know is not harmless fun. And uh, William Halstead, uh, how did they treat his cocaine addiction? Well, back then, they treated it with morphine. And so he struggled with a dual addiction his whole life and still managed to do what he did because he had a lot of facilitating help uh, to do it. So how does this work, this, this cocaine? Um, we've heard of crack cocaine. Internet pornography is crack cocaine. Well, this is dopamine and um, norepinephrine. You've heard of adrenaline. Well, it's a close cousin to dopamine. And cocaine is about dopamine. That's what really what, it's ta- what we're talking about when we talk about cocaine. This is a brain. You see all those wires. The only thing that I want you to get from this slide is you have different parts of your brain, and they talk to each other via long wires. These wires carry neurotransmitters. They carry brain chemicals. But the wires, the brain cells actually never touch. There's actually a small s- separation between the end of one brain cell's wire and the, the start of another brain cell. That's called a synapse. To get across that wire, there is a chemical signal, and that's this neurotransmitter that's released. It goes across that synapse and bonds. Now, that, see that nucleus accumbens? That's a pleasure center of the brain. Over on the far right, you see VTA. That's the dopamine factory of the brain, the ventral tegmental area. And at the way top left, you see PFC. That's the prefrontal cortex. That's the break of the brain that says, whoa, stop, don't do it, or it's going to hurt. So these areas all talk to each other. And at that synapse, you see the dopamine just about getting ready to be released into that synapse. It crosses the synapse when it fires, and it bonds to those dopamine receptors just like a lock and key. It turns on the receptor, just like a car. And when those dopamine receptors cross and lock onto the, the dopamine molecules, lock onto the dopamine receptor, it turns the, the pleasure cell on. Cocaine blocks the reuptake of the dopamine. And so the dopamine, after it does its thing, can't go back into that presynaptic vesicle anymore, and it sticks around. It's like the accelerator, the foot stays down on the accelerator for pleasure, and the engine keeps running at full blast, and the dopamine keeps boiling in that synapse, saying, you want that. Dopamine is the want-it chemical of your brain. And so if we look at different spikes up on the top left, methamphetamine, particularly methamphetamine, you get a 1,000% spike in dopamine in that nucleus accumbens. And that's why meth addicts do not do well for very long. Notice cocaine, over 300% spike in that dopamine. Nicotine, over 200. Morphine, 200% spike. But look at natural rewards, 150% spike with food. And sex is comparable, an or, sexual orgasm is comparable to morphine at 200. That's a powerful and potent natural reward. So what happens then is if you keep that accelerator on, the brain says, I like pleasure, but you're killing me. It's way too much. And in doing so, the brain cells start to change, physically change. And this is true with multiple addictions. 
you notice on that far right, the top are two normal cells. That one on the left is a dopamine-producing cell. The one on the right is a pleasure cell. On the bottom, you see a shrunken dopamine cell. What the brain says is, I like pleasure, but you're killing me. Would you turn off, would you turn off that, uh, that dopamine a little bit? And so it slows it down. It doesn't fire as much. And you have these dendrites that arborize on the other side. What that does is that it creates a new normal in the brain. In the case of internet pornography, it's harder content is needed now because you have a downgraded dopamine system. You have fewer, fewer dopamine receptors and less dopaminergic input from the ventral tegmental area with overuse of a natural or drug reward. And now the brain is craving pleasure. Okay, so this new normal means harder content, something else to kick the brain back up to speed. So now, whereas in a normal person to the left, that control frontal area has a big enough break to stop the brain, on the right, you see this decreased frontal response that also happens with addiction. And now you have this increased salience, this increased craving, and it provides the drive to use. Do we have a study on pornography specifically? We do. It's not published yet. And does this prove pornography is addictive? No, that's already been proven if you understand the evidence. I would agree that there is no smidgen of evidence that they, the sexologist, can understand. <laughs> There's a smidgen of evidence, all right. It's just that they either can't or won't understand it. Now, Valerie Voon at Cambridge has done a study. It's not published. She presented it. I spoke with her in Phoenix. And... Yes, it shows an incentive sensitization to pornography and people addicted to pornography that looks very similar to cocaine and other drugs. And so it's a really, really convincing study specifically on pornography, and it will publish uh, soon. So again, we know it already because we understand some other concepts. I'm not going to read this whole slide. You can read it later. But Mark Lewis, who is addicted to about every drug you can imagine, wrote a book about his addiction when he became a neuroscientist later. And in that, he talks about dopamine. And he says, whether in the service of food or heroin, love or gambling, and notice he's including drug and natural rewards together, dopamine forms a rut, a line of footprints in the neural flesh, and those footprints harden and become indelible, being an intractable path to a highly specialized and limited pot of gold. So what happens? What is this desire? Remember in the, the Eagles song, Hotel California, and he wrote that it's actually the lights of L.A. that they were seeing when they first came into the city. He writes that he goes up. There's a girl at this hotel. She invites him in. He thinks he says it could be heaven or it could be hell. He goes in. He ends up in a feast. Remember, they stab it, he says, in the song with their steely knives. But they just can't kill the beast. They can't satiate the craving. And then... The metaphor for addiction. Last thing I remember, I was running for the door. I had to get back to the place where I was before. Relax, said the nightman. We are programmed to receive. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Powerful metaphor for addiction. Of course, he could leave, and people can leave addiction, but only with recovery, not alone. I was uh, privileged to be a member of this uh, paper and to be a co-author which was published in the National Academy of Sciences a couple of years ago, what we did is we looked at if the brain turns on natural cravings, and we use salt craving. If an animal is depleted with salt, they form an intense craving. And so when that intense craving forms, that animal really feels a desire to gain salt. And so what happens is certain engines in the hypothalamus turn on. Certain DNA transcripts turn on and tell that brain, you need salt. You desperately want salt. What we found was that the same DNA strands and transcripts that turn on with salt craving are the same DNA strands that turn on with cocaine and with drugs. That had never been shown. And so in our paper, we summarized that it usurps these natural pathways. Drugs usurp these natural pathways, these natural reward systems. They're important in survival. The National Geographic did an article on our paper, and they said cocaine uses the same brain paths as salt cravings. They said drugs hijack. So I like those two words about our paper, hijack and usurp. I think they're accurate. It actually changes the wires in the brain. If you look here, you see on the one on the left, not as many wires. On the one on the right, you see all these arborizations and all these dendrites. Okay, so yes, this is a, actually a paper 
not looking at salt and not looking at cocaine, both of which show arborization or neuroplasticity, but this is a paper on sex, looking at sexuality from Pitchers et al. in 2010. So yes, sex is a powerful neuroplasticity modulator. Sex and neuroplasticity modulators that produce these negative uh, stereotypical behaviors are addictions. So again, the more one understands about the brain, the more one understands how we already know this is an addiction. Um, and these are simply, shows these dendrites, literally new wires and new connections are formed as these desires harden. And delta Fos B is one of the most powerful molecular switches that forms the wires. Delta Fos B is really a, a very important concept. And it's about a 30-minute talk. I don't have time for it. I'm going to skip over it. You can talk to me about it later if you'd like. But in the recent lay paper that Marianne uh, referred to, um, the authors were very dismissive of Delta Fos B. It's obvious they were not trained in biology. And Eric Nessler uh, and others have not been impressed with their response. DNA transcripts, this is DNA that turns on. And the DNA transcripts that turn on with drugs uh, this is a paper from 2005. Is there a common pathway for all addiction? Note that natural addictions are used. And note the growing evidence at the top. It says growing evidence. And think back to that smidgen of evidence again. So many neuroscientists are coming on board that, yes, there are natural addictions and that sexuality is one of them. Delta Fos B is actually a marker. Um, I'm going to go through some of these. Uh, it persists in neurons at least several weeks after cessation of drug exposure, and then epigenetic mechanisms become important where the DNA confirmation changes, and the way DNA is, is expressed becomes an addictive transcript. Um, and it's not just rodents. Some of the sexologists say, oh, these are just rats. No, there's an article uh, that just came out in 2013 and shows that the same uh, operational machinery is present in humans as well. It's scaffolding and sculpting. So we have these micro changes. Does the brain change macroscopically? It does. Um, violin players, the left hand, the part of the brain that controls the left hand gets bigger the more they play. Uh, medical students, when you scan them before studying three months, their brain gets bigger after three months of studying. Yes, our brains do change as we learn. Again, I don't have time to go into that. Um, Drakonsky, this is a great quote on how it changes. It's causative. It's not correlative. This is causation. Um, what about addiction? Every addiction looked at, drug or natural addiction, shows shrinkage of the brain, getting smaller. Okay, And yet others in recovery, and this is an internet addiction study here, same thing. Our results indicated internet addiction would result in brain structural alterations. Result, this shows recovery. Yes, we can scan recovery. We've actually seen with mindfulness therapy enlargement of gray matter with recovery. You guys ready for some hope, right? Yes. I know. I know. I'm sorry, but, I, but I, you know how many people that I'll say, yeah, but there's not really a problem. And half of my research is fighting the guys that say, it's fine. So, sorry, i got to tell you the other stuff because no, you're going to hear it. That, I was just gonna so, and, and again, I, give me five minutes. i got to tell them about hope. So, um, enlargement of gray matter for mindfulness therapy, dopamine receptor density with obesity returns to normal, and atrophy in gray matter, the shrinkage in method, amphetamine addiction, returns to more normal volumes with recovery. So we've seen it with natural and drug addictions, evidence that we can scan recovery. Um, now, this is a paper that was published. This is to go into the academic sexology side. And this is a paper that was published last summer. It was by Steele, um, Staley, Fong, and Prowse out of the SPAN lab at UCLA. This is probably the most prolific pro-porn academic source that you will see uh, at this point. They are, they are uh, pro-porn central for academic papers, and they're more coming, okay? It's not stopping. They have a press machine. This made all the networks. It was all over. This is one of the ones you probably heard about. It's not an addiction. And it's interesting because I published my paper, and it came out the same week. And it was another academic paper, and yet the journalists, who I'm sure were all biological addiction experts, right? <laughs> Which one did they run with? Is it because they were really discerning on the cellular you know, nuances? I don't think so. It's because one said, oh, porn's great. Let's do that one. Mine came out. They came out together the same week in the same journal. Nothing. So I published a peer-reviewed response to the Steele paper. And again, I don't have time to go into this, 
But this paper also was, guess what, ignored by the popular press, the same ones that ran. Now, this is a peer-reviewed response in the same journal. You'd think that since they gave the other one airtime, they'd say, oh, wait, the one that we gave airtime, there's been a, a you know, response to it. John Johnson at Penn State University um, actually contributed to this as well. So um, what, in this recent paper that just came out a few months ago, the one that you've all heard about that Marianne uh, Layden referred to, the emperor has no clothes. This is also Prowse, the same, one of the same authors from the paper that I responded to from UCLA, according to David Lay, who's in New Mexico. And they basically said that all you guys that treat, you're just a big lucrative industry. See, addiction doesn't exist. So you guys are all just bothering people by telling them they have an addiction. You need to tell them to relax and enjoy the sex because that's just the way we are, you see. And people that like a lot of pornography are just born that way. That's exactly what they say. I'm not, in fact, it's worse than I'm saying it. And when they say it, you've got to read the paper. It's hard to get because it's such an obscure journal. My medical school didn't have it. Did yours have it, Marianne? No. No, hers didn't have it either. So, I mean, it's a very obscure journal, but the press grabbed it and ran with it as if it was science or nature. So what about a large lucrative treatment industry? Now, $100 billion a year, and they didn't mention that the porn industry makes more. <laughs> yeah. Anywhere in this paper, nothing about it. They said that it provides an outlet. The more kids watch porn, they said, the less they're going to want to do things that porn shows. That's what they said. And so I wish Mayor Bloomberg would have known that. I mean, you know, at least he had good intentions. He was trying to get kids to not drink the big supersize, right? But he did it wrong. What he should have done was shown more commercials, right? <laughs> then the kids could watch the hamburgers and the drinks and they wouldn't have to eat them. <laughs> or the Super Bowl. What about the Super Bowl? You've advertisers paying uh, $4 million for a 30-second ad. So that's the, like, the wrong thing to do, guys. The more cars you show, the less cars they're going to buy. <laughs> okay, mirror sales. Harold Maras, who's the editor of the journal in which myself, the Prouses, and all this, the socio-effective journal, he's the editor of that journal. He's out of Paris. He did a paper on mirror sales. And, and again, they've been referred to already this morning. Um, and they looked at individuals looking at erotic films and looked at the mirror systems of their brain and found that individuals watching it resonate with the motivational state of other individuals appearing in visual interactions. So they're resonating. They're in the picture. They're literally projected into the film. So and this is from Gail's book, uh, Bill Margold. I'd like to show what I believe men want to see, violence against women. I firmly believe we serve a purpose in showing that. The most violent we can get is ejaculation in the face. Men get off on that because they get even with the women they can't have. We try to inundate the world with orgasms in the face. So this is his motivational state that he wants 14-year-old Johnny to emulate. Breast augmentation, a supernormal stimulus. What is a supernormal stimulus? Tin Burgeon. He, in about in 1973, he won the Nobel Prize. How? He painted bird eggs bigger and brighter. And guess what? The normal birds ignored their, their real eggs and nested these big plaster eggs. Then he got female butterflies. He painted their wings bigger and brighter. And guess what? The males ignored the real females, would not mate with them, and tried to mate the cardboard females. Supranormal stimulus. So does this count? And this is a, a study from a human ethology saying, yes, we believe that, that augmented breasts are a supranormal stimulus. And... Not only breast augmentation, which is the top, top, top cosmetic surgery, but female genital surgery. It's our Western form of female genital mutilation, right? And, uh, and basically, it's part of this sexualization of women, and it has to do with the supernormal stimulus. As Gary Alter in New York said, he performs it. Well, now women shave. Now they see porn. Now they're more aware of appearance, and he makes a living doing this. Um, pheromones. How do we stop gypsy moths? Right? With pheromones. The male can't smell the female. He becomes confused. He doesn't know which way to turn because we flood. He usually finds the female by her gentle scent, the female, butter, the female uh, gypsy moth. But when we put these artificial pheromones, he's overwhelmed. He can't smell the female, and he can't mate with her. It's happening today. Kenzie, outlet sex, it's all about orgasm. It's not about emotion. Um, so neuroscience of attachment, I'm just, I'll talk to you about that later if you'd like to come up and talk to me. It's pretty important because what it's telling us is that neuroscience of attachment says that Kinsey's wrong. We want to bond with emotion. And Cicero, in closing, if emotion be eliminated, what difference is there? I say not between a man and a brute, but between a man and a rock or the trunk of a tree 
or an inanimate object. This goes back to the neuroplastic aspect of recovery. Refrain tonight, and that shall lend a hand of easiness to the next abstinence, the next more easy, for use almost can change the stamp of nature. And, of course, addiction is a stamp. In closing, I had a um, friend that came to me with an MRI years ago, a decade ago. He was a fellow physician. He jumped on a new CAT scanner they bought in their office. He brought it by, and he said, you know, I've got this in my head. I've got tickets to the final four. Can I please leave and go? And my friend had a colloid cyst in his brain. So we had to operate. And because I knew him, I remember when I was in there taking this cyst, and I went through the, split the two halves of the brain and went straight through the corpus callosum to remove the cyst. I was right in the limbic area, the pleasure, the reward, the emotion. It was right there. And because I knew, that, knew him, it was like there is his emotion. There's his connection. It's in these delicate neural structures. Somehow, his essence is there. And it was an epiphany for me of who he was and who I was and the marvelous, the miraculous nature of what we are. And as Walter Newell said, I thought about pornography and I thought about what we lose, not just what it harms, but what we lose and losing what our brains can do with love, with connection. As Walter Newell says in this statement, young men really are designed to honor and love young women and vice versa, not to exploit them. To do this for people. This, of course, was in Des Moines. Jason Ogilvy was a construction worker. He's there working on his crane. The cup, this couple's boat over fli- flips over. The man dies. The woman is going down. She's on the way. He's a construction worker. He's not a rescuer. Has someone hook him up to a crane, swoops down, and saves her and pulls her out of that water. And that's what humanity is about. It's not about exploitation. This picture won the Nobel Prize. And this picture ended up creating me eventually. This is my parents. <laughs> and the reason I wanted to end on this is because if you look at the emotion in their face, they weren't married yet. This is one of their first dates. You just look at the magic. Now, now that's what it's about. Look, our brains can go to the moon. We can operate on ourselves. I mean, I have a brain, but I've operated on them. That's kind of an interesting thought. I operate on the thing that lets me think. Hamlet, the beautiful literature, uh, to the, the organizational ability of Don Hawkins in organizing this conference, <laughs> right? <laughs> but what we can do, but you know, we can also, though, kill and hate. Our brains can do that. But we're designed for hire. We're designed to love and to bond and to feel. And that is what it's about. It's not Kenzie's hookup. It's much, much more. We are better than that. Thank you. All right. Well, that does it for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in and for listening. Donald Hilton is a fantastic speaker, a great presenter. I hope you enjoyed the show as much as I did. Please pass this podcast along to those that you know to help us out. And if you want to, choose to support us over at Patreon by going to lovepeopleusethings.fm and clicking support. And you can see all the free stuff we give you in return. And then also by going to lovepeopleusethings.fm, you can see all the free shows that you can just listen to and educate yourself about this topic so that you can better educate other people. We're in this together. Thanks so much. Chat with you next week.